Timothy Smith Jr., pastor of New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road in the city of Memphis, Tennessee, zip code 38127. Again, uh, we thank you for joining us this day as we take in on the study of, of God's word uh, as presented in the International Sunday School lesson coming up for this Sunday, Sunday, July 12th, 2020. General subject being the boy Jesus. General sub subject, the boy Jesus. Uh, this quarter, this quarter, we're dealing with the many faces of wisdom. In this unit, unit two, we're dealing with the wisdom in the gospels, wisdom in the gospels. Again, today, I apologize for uh, the late start, but uh, as you know, um, plans are made to be broken, as, as they say. Uh, but again, we are here and we thank God for those who were able to join me. Um, I, I do realize that many uh, participate in this uh, stream uh, during the lunch break, so I may have be 30 minutes behind on some of you all, but always remember that the lesson is here. Uh, it will remain live uh, on Facebook, the accompanying notes, uh, and also sometime between now and end of day, it'll be posted on YouTube. Uh, again, this is for Sunday, July 20, 2020. Um, we thank you again for joining us. Uh, this is a meaty lesson, a very meaty lesson uh, that is before us. Um, and uh, there is some great insight to be gained. Today we're coming from uh, a portion of the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, which is the wisdom of Solomon. Um, uh, and also the gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Um, again, uh, we are happy and delighted to have you here. Uh, we will make this uh, as succinct as possible, but again, we do want to take time to give God's word uh, the attention that it deserves. Uh, what the world needs, again, today, you all, is more teaching uh, than anything. Remember, uh, the elders said the church is a hospital for the sick. That's not what the Bible says, because Jesus said at a certain point moved from the sick people because they were coming for the physical. The church is a school. Uh, we know it's a school because he tells us in the Great Commission twice to go out and teach. Amen. His, his, uh, everything about Christ is about teaching. So we need teaching. Remember, preaching is designed to bring sinners to Christ. Teaching is designed to grow saints in Christ. You get that? Preaching is designed to bring sinners to Christ. Teaching is designed to grow saints in Christ. So once you have been saved, we move away from the milk that may be found in preaching to the meat uh, and the bread that is found in the teaching of God. And we find that our churches these days are lacking uh, because we, we, we're geared to hype. We like excitement. Uh, we like singing and dancing and rejoicing. But it said the word of God is, 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 is good for sound doctrine and correction and reproof. Uh, those things we don't like. Amen. So again, we uh, we we feel like that, that we're supposed to go to get our shout on. No, we go to get our understanding on because a shout will not last. Amen. I need I need you to get that. A shout will not last. Amen. When the shout is over, it is over. Uh, we need something that's going to sustain us. Amen. It takes the word of God, the bread. The word is called the bread to put some meat on our bones. Amen. You can drink beer all day long and you'll swell up. Amen. But one trip to the bathroom and, and, and you'll see your rib cages again. But when you eat the meat, the, the meat, the bread of life, amen, it'll sustain you in a way uh, that you would never thought before possible. Again, uh, we're coming, uh, dealing with the boy Jesus, and we're going to find today wisdom even in Jesus as a boy. Uh, I love the marriage of these two books because, again, we come, we, we open up with a, uh, a, a passage from Ecclesiastes, which is the wisdom of Solomon. You know, Solomon, again, was the wisest man who ever lived. Uh, as we understand, uh, my son, uh, Rev. Morgan's on here. God bless you, Rev. Morgan. Um, we, the book of uh, Ecclesiastes is the is the wisdom of Solomon, the, the wisest man in the world, who was a major author of the book of Proverbs uh, and Songs of Solomon, and again the uh, the book of the the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes, when Solomon writes this book, he writes it. Uh, uh, in his older years, uh, and it's, a, it's an accumulation of wisdom uh, that he got directly from God and through his own life experiences. And uh, Solomon begins to, to, to sum everything up 
uh, because he had all the wealth, he had all the power, he had the ability and availability to do everything that we ever desired to do, every imagination of our heart. And Solomon came back with this assessment. He said, everything in this world is vanity. He said, the only thing that is real is God. And only what you do for God will last. And so in his accumulative wisdom, Solomon calls us to remember uh, our creator in the days of our youth before that evil days grow now. In other words, remember God while you got time. Remember God while you can enjoy him. Remember God while you got a life. It's better to give God a life of service than a life at its end. Amen. It's one thing to be in your deathbed and, and obtain salvation, but how much better is it, amen, to be able to obtain salvation while you have you and can work for God? Why? Because the Lord says this. He says, behold, I come quickly and my reward with me. I give unto every man according as his work should be. Amen. So the earlier we go in the vineyard, uh, the more opportunity we have to receive the rewards of Christ. And so uh, we open up with the book of Solomon again. Uh, who reminds us to remember God uh, while we still are available and able to serve him. And then we come, the major text come from the book of Luke. Remember the Gospels uh, all present the life of Jesus Christ. The history of the church is found in the book of Acts. And the doctrine of salvation comes in the Pauline epistles. But the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called the Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke pretty much give the same picture uh, of Christ, but they're from different perspectives. Again, you have one car accident and three, channel three, five, and 13 all get there. Each reporter is going to report about the same accident but in a different way to a different audience. And that's what they did. Uh, remember, Matthew presents Jesus Christ as a king. Mark presents him as a suffering servant. Luke presents him as a son of man. John presents him as a son of God. And so we take a Luke look, a Luke look uh, at the life of Christ today. And that's why the lesson says the boy Jesus, we want, we're looking at Jesus in his humanity. Uh, Luke presents him in his, in his humanity. Uh, there are only two books to deal with the birth of Christ. That's the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. One traces him back to David. The other traces him back all the way back to Adam. Uh, but Luke is the only one that deals anything with the childhood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be perfectly clear. In the book of Josephus and other books, uh, books of the Apocrypha, there are other writings, amen, that contain information about the books, about the life of Christ that were not canonized, included in the Bible. Uh, but the, 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 the 66 books were canonized based on their Christocracy. In other words, they all present a picture of Christ and they all, they all present him in, in his deity and they all agree, amen, agree with each other and the Holy Spirit. But, uh, in the, in, in the canonized books, uh, we find the gospel of Luke is the only one that deals with uh, anything relative to Christ's childhood. Uh, for those who do not know, uh, the notes to accompany this study are printed on my Facebook page and on the New Salem Facebook page. So you can get those notes now to look at them as we move through this lesson. You can print them off later, but they are there for your perusal uh, and they give the social scriptures so you can go back to look beyond because I want you to leave each study with something to know. Amen. Something to know and something you can refer back to. And so uh, the book of Luke uh, brings up uh, the deity, uh, but he also brings humanity. Uh, as we enter the book of Luke, Luke begins to link the birth of John the Baptist, uh, the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah is a priest and Elizabeth is the cousin of Mary. Uh, to the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. He links their birth and their ministry because we know that John the Baptist is the forerunner of Christ. John the Baptist is a prophetical bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He gets us from Malachi over into the Gospels. Amen. Uh, he closes the old writ out and brings the new writ in. Uh, he's the one that Malachi prophesied of saying that there should come one in, in, in the form of Elijah. Elijah. Amen. That is John the Baptist. Jesus declares that they this is the John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is the one uh, who leaped in the womb when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth. Amen. There was a, that was that was that was a that 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 was a womb experience. Amen. Where he re, where he felt the presence of 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 the Almighty Son of God. Amen. And so he leaped in his he didn't just shout. He leaped in the, in his mother's womb. Amen. Because the power of God is that was even that powerful even in the womb. Uh, and so he links those and he brings out some similarities uh, in the birth and the 
in the lifestyles of those two. But John, uh, uh, Luke moves on to elevate Christ. Uh, he elevates Christ because uh, there comes a separation. All of us are like Christ. But uh, unfortunately, when it, when the, as we move up in Christ, amen, there comes a separation. And the separation came in the fact that Christ had the wisdom of God. Uh, he, had, he had wisdom that even Solomon didn't possess because wisdom comes from God. But Jesus has the wisdom of God. Uh, and so he elevates Christ to help us understand that uh, with Jesus, amen, that is the wisdom of God and the word of God and God himself coming in the world into the world but John the gospel according to Saint John says it best uh John says it better than than, than anyone else could say it uh because John says it this way John says uh in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and John comes on down later on to say and the word became flesh and we beheld him as the only begotten son of God full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. So Jesus wasn't acquiring grace and truth of God. He was full of it. Amen. Because he was, he's a God man. Uh, he, he's all God and all man. And so the book of Luke presents him. Uh, he presents him from his birth uh, through his, through his childhood, all the way through his ministry. But coming into this book of Luke, we're dealing now with the boy, Jesus. We're dealing with Jesus as a, with Jesus as a child. But even in Jesus as a child, we began to see the wisdom of God. And so here we are. Our lesson today comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, 7b, and then the book of Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 52. There we find the word as follows. Solomon in Ecclesiastes says this. He says that everything there is a season, a time, and a purpose under the heaven. Now watch this. When we read the scripture, we, the scripture, the word of God, no matter which way you turn it, the word of God. So if we turn it upside down or inside out, it's still the word of God. So to everything that is a season, amen, that means, and, and if you flip it, that means for everything there's not a season. You missed that. Mm -hmm. For everything there is a season, amen. But Every time is not always the season for everything. Amen. That's the flip of what he's saying. Amen. But for everything, there is a season, there is a time and a purpose under heaven. Now watch this. He deals with the time and purpose under heaven. He relates it back to heaven because everything is useful. Everything is useful at its best when it is being used at the time and purpose defined by God. Let me say it again. Everything is at its maximum potential when it's being used in the time and the purpose as defined by God. God uh, allows us to have many great things in our life, but we misuse them. We use them out of season and we use them out of purpose. Uh, that's what's wrong with our society. We even take the word of God out of purpose. Amen. To use it for our purpose as opposed, as opposed to his. So Solomon says we got to tie everything back to heaven. Amen. Because he, he's telling us that everything in the earth is nothing but vanity. So when we want to understand the things in the earth, we got to look back to heaven. Look back to the creator who created all of these things. So yes, for everything there is a time and a purpose uh, under heaven. And he jumped down to seven be and, he, and he, he lifts up this he says a time to keep silence and a time to speak oh my goodness especially in the church you need to understand this there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak and it's not the time to speak just because you want to talk amen somebody it's not the time to speak just because you want to talk, because most of the times when we want to talk, it's when it's time to shut up. Hello, somebody. And so he says, he, he, he's, he's teaching us this. He says, uh, he, he's saying that life goes in cycles. There's a time. Seasons. Every year has one of spring, summer, fall, one of spring, summer, fall. And if you wait, your season will come back. You don't have to get out of line. Stay in line. Your season in your time will come. And wisdom 
is about learning how to live in harmony with the seasons of life. Amen. Don't be an old man trying to act like a child. And don't be a child trying to act like an old man. There's a season for childhood, a season for adulthood, and a season for old age. Amen. Uh, the worst thing in the world is a person trying to live their life out of season. When you try to live your life out of season, you're out, you're out of communion with everything else in your life because God has designed us to live according to our seasons of life and to be in harmony with ourselves, to be in harmony with our surroundings, to be in harmony with our God. We must learn how to operate in our season. And so guess what? There is a season to live, a season to die, a season to plant, a season to pluck up. There's a season for all things. Amen. A season to talk and a season to be quiet. And if we don't learn how to live in harmony through those seasons, amen, we're going to have a hard life. Because guess what? We don't have the power to change the seasons. Did you get that? We don't have the power to change the season through in our lives. And so we have to live through our ups and downs, our ins and outs our midnights and our mid-mornings, amen, because they're not controlled by us. And so some some, some wise person wrote this, this prayer called the serenity prayer, which says, God, grant me the serenity or the peace to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and most of all, the wisdom to know the difference. We got to learn what to work on and what not to work on. And when I understand that the only thing that I have the power to change is myself. And I need the power of God to help me change myself. Everything else is going to frustrate me because I have I don't have the power to change anything else. Somebody said that in, in the old saying, brighten the corner where you are. Amen. If you brighten the corner where you are, that is the start of brightening, brightening the whole room. And so Solomon is teaching us, amen, that there is a there is a time. There is a time. And guess what? Sometimes the time to talk, the time to be silent is more important than it is that than, than, than the time to talk. Uh, we think we're at our most important or, or, or our greatest moment is when we're speaking. No, your greatest moment is when you are listening. You you you, you get that? Uh, there, uh, I was when I was young in the ministry. We went to the hospital to visit one of the mothers to take her communion, and while she was delighted, we were there. We had a whole caravan with us, Amen, because we showed her support. But in a few minutes after the communion was over, people started fellowshipping, and the mother called me over to her bed and said, Pastor Smith. She said, come in. And I leaned over here. She said, she said, if you don't mind, well, y'all get out of here. Amen. Uh, at the, at that instant, it, it kind of hurt my feelings, but, 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 the, but the Holy Spirit spoken to me and said, listen to what she's saying. Uh, because sometimes to a sick person, noise, folk talking calls pain. Amen. We had, we came to bring her communion. We didn't come to have no part in her room. Amen. And so she politely asked for us to get out of there, and we did. And so I've learned, amen, wisdom teaches you, amen, that all the time is not the time to run your mouth. Sometimes we have to be we have to be silent. And guess what? We learn more in silence than we do in speaking. Amen, somebody. Sometimes people don't need you to say anything. They just need you to listen. We need to learn how not to try to respond to every statement everybody makes. Sometimes listen. We get into arguments and fight trying to respond to every, every, every statement. If we will learn to listen, amen, to give people a chance to explain themselves, then we'll, we would understand better, and then it will cause less confusion. There is an old saying about the wise old owl who, who, the wise old owl who said in an oak, the more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke and the more he heard, why can't we all be like that wise old bird? You know, we need to do more listening. It, it, it's amazing that when you look at the human anatomy, God gave us uh, two ears. He gave us two eyes. He even gave us two nostrils, but he only gave us one mouth. You got two of everything on your head except mouths. Amen. He gave you one mouth because we need to look more. We need to hear more. We need to listen more. We need to see more. Amen. Then we talk. But in our estimation, we think we're at our best when, we, when we're talking. We're at our best when we're listening. God bless your heart. Listen, let's let's move on. So in verse 39, we begin to move down in the loop. And this verse comes immediately uh, after they had presented Jesus to the temple. Now, remember, uh, so we don't get confused. Uh, we're dealing with two separate things. 
the first portion of this chapter deals with them presenting Jesus in the temple as a child. When they dedicate him to the, the they, they would dedicate the child. And in the Baptist churches, we dedicate babies. We don't christen babies. We dedicate babies. Amen. They christen babies in, in the Catholic church. They baptize babies. We don't baptize babies. Uh, we believe in the, 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 the baptism is on profession of your faith. Amen. And the baby has not yet reached the age of reason where they have, they're able to profess a hope or faith in Christ. So we bless the baby. We dedicate them. Uh, as, as 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 Hannah's child was dedicated back to God. We dedicate them, we pray over them, and we ask God's blessing upon them that they may be trained up in a way that would lead them to Christ. I think I thought I would just just clarify that we bless babies. We don't baptize or we don't we don't christen. Amen. Um and so as we move in this lesson, uh they they have dedicated G took Jesus to the temple for dedication and while they were there they meet uh they meet Anna's and her husband and they and and they they look at Jesus and they begin to see, Amen. Even as a baby, that he is the promised King of God. So after that, uh, then they go back home. But they have a history, a habit of following, being obedient to the law, where they come into Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. And so it said, verse thirty nine. And when they had performed all these things according to the law, they returned into Galilee. Uh, into their own city, Nazareth. And again, this is just after they have dedicated Jesus uh, to, to, to Christ, God, according to the law. And then they begin to return home. Now, when they return home, they are going back to what they know as their everyday life, their 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 norm, their normal life. Amen. There are God says we are in the world, not of the world. And being in the world, there are some things in the world that we must do. Amen. All of your time is is not about direct worship. Most uh, most of your time is indirect worship. Let me explain what I'm saying. Amen. Adam didn't spend all of his time in the garden talking to God. God said, I want you to dress and keep the garden. You got that? And when you dress and keep the garden according to God's instructions, that's indirect worship. Amen. Because those things you see growing in the garden, you know, are of God. So there is some indirect work that we must do in this world. Uh, you don't have to walk around talking and speaking in, I don't, speaking in tongues all the time. That's not what God expects of you. He don't expect his preachers to walk up and down the street, street preaching and singing 24 hours a day. No, he knows that, he, that we are in this world. Amen. And so uh, we indirectly work, worship him by keeping the laws of the land, by doing what is right, by being obedient. That way, amen, we magnify him and make him known in the world. And then we use those opportunities to witness as they present themselves. Are we getting this? Amen. So Adam was not talking to God every all day, every day. He met him in the cool of the day. But at the other times, he was dressing the garden according to God's word. And when you do the work in the world according to God's word, that's called indirect worship. And so they went back for indirect worship because guess what? They had to raise Jesus. They had to raise James and Joseph. Joseph, they had to raise their other children in the word of God. What does Proverbs 22, 6 says? It says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart. Amen. So their job was to go home and raise godly children. It wasn't to go home and speak in tongues and offer sacrifices all day. Amen, somebody. And so they went back home after they had done what they were supposed to do in the temple, dedicate the child. Then they went back home in verse 40. OK, because they they honor Proverbs 22, 6, they were training their children correctly. In verse 40 says this, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Did you get that? And the child grew uh huh, and waxed strong. In the spirit, he was strong in the spirit of God. Amen. Because in addition, in addition to what was going on in the temple, they fed in the word of God. The book of Deuteronomy says our house should be filled with things of God. His word should be on our baby's bedpost, on the doorpost, on the doorpost of our home, on the gatepost, on your mailbox. Everywhere your child turned, they should see the word of God. In the old days, at least every home had a Bible on the coffee table and a picture of the, a communion in the dining room. Y'all remember that? 
Every house you went in had a Bible on the coffee table and a picture of the communion uh, on, uh, on Last Supper on the wall. Amen. Uh, and, and we and, and folk laughed and made fun of that. Hey, man, but look at our homes today. We don't you can you walk in the house and look around. You have to find a Bible. And there's no symbols of Christ. We got pictures of everything. It, 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 and we argue about what color the pictures should be. Hey, it does not put a picture up there. Amen. At least bring up the conversation. God told Israel to put stones and things in certain places to make children ask questions. Why? To begin to generate conversations. Amen. About God. And then you can teach them in the way. But in our home, our home, uh, it's hard, even in Christian home, to find even a symbol of God. And so the child grew and waxed strong in his spirit, uh, and he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God. Now, 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 watch this. Luke begins, okay, to contrast, as I said, the life and the ministry of Christ with that of with that of John the Baptist. If you look at Luke one eighty, uh, he says it's about John the Baptist, and the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit. Same words, right? And was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. And so watch this. Now, when we begin to look at Jesus, he mentions something different. He says Jesus grew in wisdom. And so also what he's doing is he, he, he compares them, but he highlights the wisdom of God only in Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus, as John said, was full of grace and truth. Jesus was a word. He was full of God's word. Amen. Even from birth. Amen. Not in, It was not in bloom, but it was in him. Amen. You get that? The word was not yet in bloom, but it was in him. And so he began to grow in God's grace and he began to grow in God's, in God's wisdom. So again, even though he, there are similarities, amen, John, uh, Luke is not slack in his making sure we understand the deity that pre-existed in Christ. You get that? The deity that pre-existed in Christ. He's in verse 41, he says this, he says now, okay, now we're 12 years later. Amen. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. They've been doing this all of Jesus' life for the last 12 years. Why did they do this? Because the Mosaic law said, according to the God gave Israel instructions, amen, that they were to go every year to celebrate the Feast of the Passover. What's the Feast of the Passover? The Feast of the Passover was a celebration to remind Israel how when they were in bondage in Egypt in the land of Goshen, the death angel came by night, amen, to kill the firstborn. That was the time when they put the blood blood over the door and the death angel passed them over. That's why it's called the Passover, because the angel of death passed them over, a lamb's blood. That's why Jesus is called the Passover lamb, because he's our sacrificial lamb. His lamb, his blood covers the doorpost of our heart. Amen. And the final death angel, amen, not, not the natural death angel, but the spiritual death angel, amen, passes over us and we don't have to we don't have to suffer that spiritual death. Amen. So every year they observe they observe the customs of the law. Amen. And they went to observe the Passover. This was nothing new. Amen. But now uh this is something they did every year. And you find that in Exodus 41. I'm sorry, Exodus 12. He says in verse Exodus 24, he says, and ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and thy sons forever, that ye shall say it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the house of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Amen. So the Passover was a remembrance. Uh, the Passover celebration to Israel is like communion is to the church. You get that? Passover celebration is to Israel what communion is in the church. It is an ordinance for us to remember, amen, what God did to spare our lives. In verse 42, he comes and he says this. Uh, he says, and when he was 12 years old, so now 12 years old. Okay, so remember, don't, don't get those verses mixed up. We open up after his birth, dedicated in the temple. In verse 41, this happened every year. And in verse 42, now we're in the 12th year of Jesus' life. You get that? 
All right, just because the verses come right behind each other, don't assume this was the same time. It says, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem, just like they did in verse 41, after the custom of the feast. Now, again, the Passover feast was this way. They they had an evening feast, and then they celebrate the feast of the, of, of, of the tabernacles for seven days. So each time they went, it was like an eight, it was like a seven and a half or an eight day celebration. And so now Jesus is 12 years old, okay? Now, this is significant. I need to stop and pause here for a minute to make sure we understand. We had too many older older saints uh, who believed that a child couldn't get baptized when he was 12 years old. Amen. This custom has nothing to do with the church. They presented, they would bring a child at 12 or 13. We're not even sure. Amen. Because the Jewish by mitzvah, amen, in Mishnah, amen, which, 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 was, doc, which was a history of bar mitzvah, Mishnah, amen, a child was considered uh, accountable at the age of 13. Uh, in the old days, amen, the father stood for the sins of the children until they reached the age of accountability. Amen. Uh, in the church age, you stand for your own sin every day of your life. Amen. I can't stand for my children's sin because I can't stand my own sin. Amen. I'm not right enough to stand for anybody's sins, not even my own sins. Amen. So uh, and, and so uh, they they would bring a child in as an adult. Now, Jesus was no longer a baby, but he was not yet considered a full adult. Are you all with me? He's not yet considered a full adult. Because Mishnah or Bar, Bar Mitzvah would take place, he was fully accountable at the age of 13. And so because that happened back then, uh, many people kind of believe uh, that a uh, child couldn't come to Christ even before he's old. This had nothing to do with Christ. Amen. This was Old Testament. This was Old Testament custom. Are y'all with me? This was under another law. This was under the Mosaic law, under the Mosaic covenant, not under, 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 under the blood covenant. And so at that point in time, 12 slash 13 was considered the age of accountability. OK, now now that's when the Jews considered a young man capable of being a man. And why is it 12, and 13? Because boys at 13 and girls at 12. Oh, my goodness. Why boy 13 and girls at 12? Because girls were faster. No. It's because girls married earlier. Mm -hmm. Girls married earlier. There was a custom where families were eager to get rid of daughters because they had to feed them. But they were eager to keep sons because sons fed them. The, the, the family has to feed the daughter, but the sons feed the family. That's why men were considered blessed to have many sons because the daughters were going to be part of somebody else's family. As a matter of fact, they often gave dowries to go along with the daughter to get you to come get this daughter. Amen. So the daughters were, were missed for the 12 and the boys at 13. But now we deal with the age of reason or the age of accountability. Now, what does that mean? For a Christian in the church age, this is how the age of accountability is determined. It's determined from child to child. When a child is able to know right from wrong, that child needs to be saved. Let me slow that down. When a child is able to know right from wrong, they need to be saved. Let me show you what I'm saying. When your baby was 15 months old or two years old, let's say, let's, let's go two years old. You get him a birthday party. And you held the baby up in front of the kid and said, here, Pookie, blow out the candles. Pookie reached over and grabbed a big hunk of that cake and put it straight in his mouth. And Pookie didn't care who saw it. Are you with me? That's a baby. He didn't care about wrecking the cake. He didn't care about you getting mad at us. Pookie saw that cake and wanted that sweet ice in his mouth. And Pookie ruined the whole cake, just reached and grabbed it. And stuck it straight in his mouth while you held it. All right, you with me? Now, Pookie, five years old, four years old, some age, and you give Pookie a birthday party. You give him Pookie a birthday party. And you, you cook the same cake. And the cake is sitting up, but the party has not started. But while you all are in the decorating, Pookie decides he wants some of the cake. 
And so Pookie now comes like he did when he was two years old and sticks his hand in the cake and he starts eating it. But when you walk in the room now, Pookie, rather than letting you see him eat the cake, Pookie takes and stick his hand full of cake behind his back to hide what he's doing. When Pookie is smart enough to hide his crime, Pookie needs Christ. Are you all with me? That's how you determine the age of accountability in the church age. Had nothing to do with your physical age. Amen. There are some young children who are highly accountable and some older children who are not accountable at all. Amen. So the age of accountability when the age when a child comes to Christ has nothing to do with being 12 years old. Amen. You cannot tie that back to the to the Mosaic covenant. Amen. We must tie to the blood covenant when we know that we that that, that we have done wrong. Pookie knew he did wrong. That's why he hid his hand. So guess what? Pookie needs to be saved, to be taught. Amen. Right from wrong. Or how to handle his wrongness. You don't hide your hand behind your back. You heart you hide your heart in Christ. Amen. That's what we begin to teach. Okay. Verse 43. Amen. And when they fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind his room, and Joseph and Mary knew not of it. Now watch what happened. Remember I told you they were going in for the, fe for the feast. It's, it was one evening. And then the next seven days celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles. I'm sorry, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pretty much kind of, kind of the same thing. And so they were there about seven or eight days. Okay. It's a lot of people there because they're not the only ones to go. Okay. And they're having their celebration, okay? And they are like new age parents. Now, what do I mean new age parents? When I was a child and I, my parents took me to church, they always knew where I was. And their eyes were always on me. And the usher never had to say anything to me. My mama or my daddy gave me a look. Well, my daddy looked at the pulpit across the top of his glasses. Oh, I don't care where I was in the church. I knew what that meant. And when my mama turned around, amen, I had to be present, accountable, and where she told me to be. Amen. They always knew where their children were. But these days, we go to church and we sit down and our children run all over the church, tap the church, fellowship hall, bathroom. We don't care where they go, as long as they ain't bothering us. Amen. And when they bring your child, you done broke something, then you want to get mad. Oh, my goodness. Somebody say, ouch. I know you don't like this. All right. But but this is the word of God. It's for correction. And so guess what? In the midst of their celebration, they forgot about Jesus. And they lost their Christ consciousness. When they lost their Christ consciousness, that allowed them to leave the temple and leave Jesus behind. We got most church members who lead the church without a Christ conscious. Amen. Which means they lead the church and Christ is nowhere on their mind. We leave him at the church. Amen, somebody. That's why we leave the church just like we came. Some of us leave worse than we came. Because while we got there, we didn't hear the message. We heard some mess. You left, the, you left the sanctuary when the preacher started preaching, went over in the fellowship hall or in the bathroom and heard the smoke of a cigarette and heard somebody was saying about you. Now you mad. And so guess what? You have no Christ consciousness. Watch this. You may have, your mind may be on Christ, but you, and you're trying to hear the sermon, but somebody starts arguing. Amen. Your mind quickly diverts from Christ, the word of God, to that argument. You lose Christ consciousness. And whenever you lose Christ consciousness, you're going to lose Christ. Are, are you all getting this? Amen. The spirit will leave you just as fast as it can. It will leave you faster, actually. So they get up. Amen. And they get ready to go back home. And neither one of them have a clue where Jesus is. They, they, they are assuming where he is. Watch this in verse 44. And they supposing, which means they assume him to have been in the company in that big crowd. Don't know who he went away in or what he's doing. They didn't think he in the crowd. Amen. When a whole day's journey and saw them among the kinfolk and acquaintances, this is what happened. They were on their way back home in the crowd. They didn't join the crowd. They're not enjoying the Christ. They didn't join the crowd. Many people go to church to enjoy the crowd instead of the Christ. But when they had to stop 
and camp out for the night. When they made a pallet for each of their children, they noticed one of the pallets were empty. And guess whose pallet it was? It was Jesus. Amen. And many of us leave worship to go camp somewhere in our life. And when we try to lay a place for Jesus, we notice that we didn't bring him with us. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. Why? Because we lost God. We lost Christ's consciousness. And when they lost Christ's consciousness, they, they had assumption instead of assurance. Oh, my God. They assumed Christ. And we got a whole lot of folk assuming a lot of stuff about Jesus. I just watch folk wearing these T-shirts assume because your T-shirts say too blessed to be stressed. Ain't nothing going to bother you. Just because you sing the song, God gonna tell you what the devil stole, you looking to get you looking to get back what them folk got that broke in your house. It does not work like that. Amen. God is not some cliche. God is not some saying. We need assurance. We need assurance instead of assumption. There are too many folk assuming they're going to heaven. That's why James said, be ye doers of the word, not forget for hearers deceiving yourself. Some of us have deceived ourselves through, through assumption. But if we look at our behavior, even in church, the word of God will tell you, you ain't going to heaven like, like doing what you're doing. Thinking what you're thinking, acting like you acting, behaving like you behaving, living like you living. There are going to be some folk in heaven you thought shouldn't be there and going to be some folk in hell you thought should have been in heaven. Why? Because we are assuming. Don't assume. I love 1 John 3, 14 because he says, and we know that we pass from death and life because we love the brother. What? Why? Because we love people that we don't like. Why? Because I've learned how to look beyond folk fault and see their needs. I've learned to look at folk that I don't like and realize I don't like them because they remind me of me. I, I can look at folk who are failing and falling and say, but for the grace of God, that's go why. Because I'm full of failures and faults too, but God is keeping me covered. I'm going to shout if you don't shout. Amen. And, 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 and if you are a true born child of God, when you look at the difficulties brought, God has brought you through and kept them covered from the world, that's what makes you shout. You don't need anybody to pump you and prime you. The writer said, when I think of God's goodness and all he's done for me, you don't know my story, you don't know my glory. But oh, when I think about it. I get a jar at the world don't understand. And the world can't take it because they don't know where it's coming from. Woo! Did you get that? The world can't take my joy and they can't steal my joy. They don't know where my joy come from. My joy comes from my story in Jesus. The songwriter said, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's my joy. And that's why it's joy that's unapproachable or joy that's unstillable because you don't know where it comes from. Amen. It comes from my experience with Christ. Amen. Because I know that I am a child of God. Despite my failures, my faults, and my frailties, I know I am a child of God, not because how I act in church, not because how I act when you're looking, it's about a constant relationship with God, amen, that's full of ups and downs. Hello, somebody. God bless your heart. Verse 45. So they want to hold their journey assuming. How many years of your life have you assumed you walking with Christ? And he ain't even in the crowd. Watch this. Not only is Christ not with you, he not even in the crowd. Oh, Lord. It's bad. Any crowd that does not contain Christ is a mob. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Okay. And when they found him not in verse 45, they turned back again, seeking him. Wow. 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 Let me, let, let me, count, let me kind, of, kind, kind, kind of put this in your lap. Gabriel came to Mary and told her, you should be able to have the Holy Ghost. The thing you should see should be called a child of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. 
He went to Joseph. They know that this is the son of God. And guess what? They lost him. They left him. They left him. I, I, let it soak in. Let me, I want you to let you soak in for a second. I, I, I know time right now. I need, you, I need us to let, let you soak in. We don't get anything else. Let's get this. They lost. They left. The only begotten son of God. They lost the word of God, the precious lamb of glory, the immaculate lamb of God, the bomb of Gilead, the lit in the valley, the bright morning star, the day spring, the living water, the living bread. They lost him. Now, God chose you out of all in the earth to be the mother of his only begotten. He ain't going to have no more. His only begotten son. And you lost him. Hmm. You better find him. Now, we can sit here and point our finger at Mary and Joseph. Yeah. Uh-huh. But we'll get her the same thing, not once, but often. Because that same Jesus that, that took the stripes, that took the nails, that took the beating, took the lashes, that hung, bled, and died in your stead, that his spirit might dwell in you. How many times you walk off and leave his spirit? Hmm. Huh. So when we do that, we have left the work of God, the will of God, the way of God, and the word of God, which puts us at greater risk than Mary and Joseph. And they had no choice but to turn. That's what the Lord tells us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. When, when you find yourself without, if you would turn from your wicked ways and then turn to me, because guess what? When you walk away from the spirit of God, you have walked into wickedness. You walk toward wickedness. Are you, are you, are you, all, you all with me? Look at Isaiah uh, 55, 6 and 7. He said, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Whatever they were thinking, they weren't thinking about Jesus. Whatever they were going, they weren't, they weren't going with Jesus. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly part. Mary and Joseph needed forgiveness because they walked off and left him. And whenever God blesses you with the, with the presence of his spirit, if you walk off and leave his spirit, you need forgiveness. Forgive me, God, for walking off and, 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 and leaving, forgetting what Jesus died for, what he took 39 lashes and three nails for, 72 dawn, and I walk off and leave it. What he came all the way down through four two generations for, I walked off and left it. We need forgiveness because we walk in assumption instead of assurance. And so they have no choice but to go back and find it. Now, let me put this in your lap. We want to say, I'm going to take back what the devil stole. No, the devil can't steal from you. You had to give it to him. The devil can't take anything from you. If your joy gone, you gave it away. If your peace gone, you gave it away. We need to quit lying on the devil and begin to blame the one who really fought or blame the real devil. And that's us. Because the devil can't steal what God gave you. Not, not, not after you have received it. After you have released and Daniel 10, of course, the blessing was held up for Daniel. But after you received it, the only way he can get it is you got to give it away. Hello, somebody. Y'all might have quiet out there. And they found out they went back to Jerusalem again, seeking him. Again, they went back where they last saw him. The writer says, take me back. Take me back, the Lord, to the place where I first received you. And every once in a while, 
You all let your mind go back to the place where you first received him. Amen, somebody. Because along the way, we've been jaded. We've been hurt. We've cried. We've been stabbed. We've been wounded. We've been injured. And sometimes we, we don't see nothing but the scar. But you ought to just go back some, every once in a while. Let your mind go back to the time you first received it. Amen, somebody. So I can get some fresh joy. Amen. If you're walking, if you've been to the well, got a bucket of water, on the way back to the house, you trip and fall and spill the water, don't keep going to the house. Go back to the well. Did you all get that? Don't go on to the house with an empty bucket when the well is still there with more water. Go back to the well. And get you. you got two choices. You can go to the house and cry about the water you spill, or you can go back to the well and get a new bucket. Hey, somebody, I'm about to shout myself. You all keep on sitting there and just let me have church by myself. I'm about to shout. And I'm glad I got a well I can go back to. Every day of my life, I can go back to the well. Old writer said, living one thirst, living water thirsty one, stoop down, drink and live. And every time my soul gets thirsty, I can stoop at the well. Amen. And get me to be, I have to keep on crying about spilled water. Amen. It's a well full. Amen. As a matter of fact, it should be a well of water sprinkled everlasting life out of my belly. Hello, somebody. And it came to pass 46 after three days. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now, watch it. They found him in the temple. Jesus in the temple. They found him what he's supposed to be. And if you are God's child, you are his temple, which means he's supposed to be found in you. Because guess what? There are some more Mary and Joseph's. I'm teaching this lesson, y'all. There are some more Mary and Joseph's in the world in search of Jesus. And they ought to be able to find him in us, his temple. They found him sitting. Uh huh. In the midst of doctors, both hearing them and asking questions, he wasn't running his mouth. He was hearing them, and he was asking thoughtful questions. Now he's sitting with the doctors. They're not medical doctors. They're doctors of the scripture. You know how all every preacher in the world now is a doctor until you hear him speak and can't master the king's English and you, and you realize something different. So watch this. Three days, which meant they had two sleepless nights. But what if you hear about three days and two nights? That looked like the time he was in the grave, but he, but he was no longer with us on, on earth then. The three days and two nights, they were without Jesus, foreshadows his crucifixion and his resurrection. In three days, they found him. Are you with me? Luke 24, 7. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be crucified in three days. I'll be back. Amen. So they, the third day, amen, there Jesus was in the temple, the same temple, where 12 years later, Simeon and Anna, as I mentioned earlier, saw him as a child and said, he's God's promised king. But they told Mary then, they said, he set for a rise and fall, said, Arrow going to pierce your heart. Amen. Because guess what? Anytime we align ourselves and associate ourselves with Christ, we put ourselves in line for suffering. That's why Solomon said there's a time for all things. There's a time for crying and a time for rejoicing. Remember that. But remember, it goes in cycles. So you can cry for the night because David said in the morning, a new cycle starts. Joy coming. Are you all, you all still here? And so watch this. He's not asking foolish questions and he ain't in there running his mouth. He is listening and asking questions, which means he is in learning mode. Now, on your notes, the 46 years that I got, listening and learning comes before leading and lording. Mm -hmm. Listening and learning become before leading and lording. Before God calls you to lead, he'll put a learning, a yearning for learning in your spirit. If you don't desire to study the word of God, it's not likely God called you. Amen. Out somebody. Ouch. 
you ought to have a yearning for his word. So it bothers me when I hear preachers who you know have not studied. And when somebody has not studied the word of God, it's obvious to those who have studied. So it does not matter how many doctors you got on your name, if you have not studied the word of God, your lack is obvious. Hello, somebody. And so listening and learning comes before leading and learning. I don't want to know how well you can talk. I want to know how well you can listen. Because your ability to listen is directly proportionate to your ability to learn. And a person who does, who just talks all the time and never listens, that's why I that's why I favor Bible study over what I'm doing now. Because I can't hear you all. I can't hear you. In Bible study, which I love, I love, I love teaching. I love teaching when I do preaching. Because guess what? We can dialogue. I can determine my effectiveness. I, I can determine what disciples you got it. And so listening and learning come for leading Lord. Stop trying to lead folk and you don't know nothing yourself. Amen, somebody. Watch this in verse 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And so guess what? They're looking at Jesus and they are amazed at how rich in the word of God he is. Begin, remember I told you before God called you, he'll put a yearning for learning. Matthew 5, 6, that he said, blessed they was hunger and thirst of the righteous, for they shall be filled. If you have a, a real hunger and thirst for the word of God, amen, he'll put you in a position to get it. Amen, and you'll go after it. You shall be filled if the, if the yearning is there. And so Jesus has already surpassed what we would call his years. Amen. Because of his in-depth word, study, not the word of God. But remember, John said he was the word become flesh. So watch this. Youth is no excuse. You all get that? Youth is no excuse. As a matter of fact, God generally called people in their youth. In the youth. Amen. There may be some people we may consider he called old in the Bible, but according to the lifespan, they were in their youth. Uh-huh. Look at Matthew 5, 6. He said, again, blessed are they. Matthew 7, 28 says this. He says, Nick has come to pass when Jesus ended these sayings. The people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now, let, let me help you here. This is this is this is what I mean about truly being called and sin having yearning. The scribes knew the word. But they didn't know the man. So all they could do was say the word. But Jesus taught as one who had authority because he was backed by the power of God. God had ordained his ministry. And there are many who know the word, but there is no power and in, in no spirit with it. Why? Because they're just words. And Paul says in, in, in 13 Corinthians, he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am as a tinkling cymbal and a sounding brass. You got a lot of folk who sound good saying nothing. Hello, somebody. 48. And when they saw him, now, now watch this. Please get this setting. I, I'm trying to hear, <clears throat> but this is a lot of meat. Jesus is there, 12 years old. In with doctors, dealing with theology beyond his years. And even the doctors are amazed. Mary and Joseph have just found, rediscovered their blessing, the Son of God. They just found Jesus, and guess what he's saying? He's not hurt, he's not harmed. It ought to be a time for joy. But look at Mary's church disposition. Her church's disposition, like a lot of folk come to church, thinking it's about them as opposed to being about him. You all didn't see that coming, did you? We got too many folk coming to church thinking it's about them instead of him. Now, 47, everybody there is astonished. But in 48, rather than fall on the knees saying, thank God my child is saved. And when they saw him, they were amazed. What they're amazed at. As the mother said to him, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, 
thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. Trying to steal the joy of the congregation with their sorrow. That's how folk come to church. They come to church with their own personal selfish sorrow to steal the joy of the Lord out of your spirit. Rather than getting happy like everybody else, they want everybody else to get sad or sour like them. And so guess what? They go in in a time that should have been full of joyful amazement and they are disdained. And we got folk who got up with their health and their strength, clothes in their right mind, will walk into church and get mad when you don't compliment their clothes. You don't speak to them. I didn't come to speak to you. I didn't come to see you. I came to have a talk with Jesus. Amen, somebody. And so don't try to ruin my spiritual experience because you sour, because you insecure. Need somebody to speak to you and compliment your clothes. You know what you got on. And you got a mirror. Why have I got to spend 30 minutes talking about what you what you wearing and what you driving? And you already know what it looked like. Hello, somebody. That's why I, I didn't come to church for that. I came because I needed him. And that's what you should have came for. Not to get my praise, but to give him some praise. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, when I got, if when I get through giving him the praise he deserved, I don't have any left for anybody else. Are you, are, are, are you all with me? Look at what I gave you for verse 48. Look at, look, look, look at what I gave you. I gave you two points. And be sure to get these when you teach this lesson, teach it. First point of 48 is this, is that we blame to cover our shame. Mary and Joseph ought to be shame of themselves for leaving Jesus in the first place. Ought to be shame of themselves for going a whole day and not knowing he was there. Ought to be shame of themselves to take three days to find him. Ought to be shame of themselves not to know what to look in the first place. They lost God's son. Are y'all with me? Now, it's a shame for a parent. They're like parents leaving their children in them hot cars burning up. The parents ought to be shamed. Don't, don't go out there and cuss your child out for dying in the hot car. Cuss yourself out for leaving the child in the hot car. So they want to come back with attitude and, and deflect the blame on the him. So watch this. We, whenever you trying to blame somebody, you're trying to cover your shame. You got that? Number two, I am so full of me that I cannot see. Some of us come to church so full of ourselves, we can't see the sermon. We can't see the word. We can't hear the meaning behind the choir song. We full of self. And they are so full of self, they can't see what's happening right before their eyes. Jesus, the son they were told about, is coming into his own. The word is speaking the word. But yet they so full of self, they don't see the historic event. This event is so historic, we talking about it now. They right there on the scene, I witness it, and don't know what's going on. Why? Because I'm so full of me, I can't see. And some of us will never be able to see Jesus because we so full of ourselves. That's what was wrong with Israel. Israel was so full of their self until they said, Gee, this can't be Jesus. He don't look like my king. He don't like my savior. Well, I just want to know, is he what God sent? Oh, my God. I got to tell this story real quick. I'm trying to make it quick. Uh, my sister, she know I tell her all the time. She would ask God for a husband. Prayed and her alarm kept going off and this, this technician kept coming and he came and and he left and the alarm went back off. He came back in and she and she started thinking something. And she started looking at him and he didn't meet our standards. And, and he left, the alarm went back off again. And she he came back and she knew God was sending that man back to her. She didn't like how his pants were fitting. And she said, God, you must be joking. Sending me this. Ha <laughs> ha! It does not matter whether he meets your standard. Is he what God chose? And if, and if it's what God chose, you can't go wrong. Amen. You can lose with the stuff you choose, but you can't lose with the stuff God chose. 
Amen. I'm going to get out of here. I know y'all got tired of me because this, this lesson is making somebody mad. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? All right. Uh, let me get back here and I'm going to wrap this thing up, you all. Uh, and verse 49, and he said unto them, how is you do not where I was? I'm a, my father's business. Real quickly, I'm, 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 I'm cutting across the corner now. Jesus said, you all should have known, first of all, because of what Gabriel told you, the angel told you. Uh, now I must be about father's business. This is the first time Jesus identifies God as his father. So in other words, Jesus said, don't be blaming me, blame yourself, because you all should have known, number one. Every parent, I don't know where their children are. And then he identifies Joseph, God as his father, which means now Jesus separated himself from Joseph. Jesus separated himself from Joseph at the temple. He separates himself from Mary at the cross. Amen. He, 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 he's aligning himself with the father. And he said, I must be by my father's business. Watch this, which means I know what my father's business is. Notice that Jesus could talk about scriptures. That means he knew what Isaiah said about it, that a virgin should bear a son. If he knew scripture, that means he knew about Isaiah 9, 6, under the child of one, the son is given. If he knew about the old scripture, he knew Joel said, at some time, I pour my spirit among men. He knew he was a little in the valley. They even talked about an invited morning star. He knew he was a lamb of God. Amen. He knew he was ramming the bush. He knew all that stuff. Amen. And he knew he knew what his mission was. And so he knew that, guess what? That Mary's heart going to be broken, not just then, but her heart's going her heart's gonna to be broken again when uh, he moved out to St. Ed Calvary. All right. So he's doing the work of his father. I'm, I'm coming to do the work of a savior, not of a carpenter. Verse 50. And they understood not the things which he spoke. Why? Because they were in the flesh. I'm so full of me, I cannot see. She was in so much flesh, she couldn't see the word of God. Amen. And so uh, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, that man cannot understand the things of God. Amen. And so we leave church empty because we didn't go in the spirit. If you leave church empty, don't talk about the preacher didn't preach nothing. If they read the scripture, you should have got happy. If the quiet song song should have got happy. The serve was nothing because you didn't put anything in it. Finally, verse 51, and they went down and he came to Nazareth and he said to them, watch this. God does not go back on his word and he does not bypass his authority. God gave the parents authority over the children. And so Jesus was such to them. Ephesians 6, 1, 2 says, children, obey your parents. That included Jesus. If Jesus had to obey Mary and Joseph, how about you and your parents? But his mother kept all these things in her heart. This is you got to say about Mary. She didn't understand. But she kept them in her heart, which means she was remembering and she was thinking on what had happened in that situation. And so because and she would understand it after the cross. The songwriter said we will understand it better by and by. Don't forget the word of God because it doesn't make sense to you right now. Keep chewing on it. And after a while, by and by, you will understand it. Finally, in verse 52, he says this. He says, uh, and Jesus increased in wisdom uh, and in stature and in favor of God and with man. So watch this. Again, we, he talks about Jesus increasing in wisdom and stature in front of God because that's what matters. God said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Does not matter how men see you. How does God see me? The same Jesus that was despised and rejected of men was approved by God. John 1, 1 John 2, 17 says this. The world passed away. Uh, the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth ever, which means this, only what you do for God will last. Amen. That's godly wisdom, knowing, in summation, only what you do for him will last. Paul told Timothy, the study shows have proven to God, not man. So let us work to be approved unto God. That is the wisdom of God, because in God's wisdom brings us back to God. Amen. I apologize for going over, but again, this was a meaty, meaty lesson. Uh, if you need the notes for this lesson, it is posted on my Facebook page and on the New Salem, New Salem Facebook page. Uh, I truly thank you for giving me your time. May God bless you, keep you now and forever. Amen.